It's safe to say people today enjoy more sexual freedom than ever before. Sometimes we can take this freedom for granted, never once entertaining the idea that it can all be taken away in a moment's time, as history has repeatedly shown. Stephen Tushin helped redefine and shape modern perceptions of what is and what isn't obscene, but faced an uphill battle with the moral right and the government, which was practically synonymous in the early days of pornography. The Bijou Theater opened its doors in 1970 during the height of the sexual revolution and at a time when artists and filmmakers were starting an underground film scene in various parts of the country. Two film buffs, along with Steven Tushin, began an empire of adult theaters in Chicago, but above all, the Bijou Theater became famous for being a sexual emporium for men. The name Bijou would go on to become synonymous with gay porn films and distribute some of the biggest classics in the genre. Centurions of Rome was one of the many films that was distributed by Bijou Video and claims to be one of the most expensive gay films of its time at a budget of nearly $100,000. Released during the golden era of porn, Centurions of Rome was directed by John Christopher and starred newcomer Scorpio and veteran George Payne. Though the film was ambitious, it is the behind the scenes of the film that is amazing. In this episode, we're going to celebrate Stephen Tushin, professional defendant whose businesses were raided and would go on to spend a majority of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s fighting obscenity charges and avoiding federal prison. I'll also discuss Bijou Video and the Bijou Theater, a landmark in gay porn history during its decades-long run, the people and the interesting story behind the theater, and everything else wrapped up in its history. And finally, a brief look at the making of Centurions of Rome, a story of a sociopath, a million-dollar bank robbery, and the rumor that the film is owned by one of the most prestigious insurance companies in London. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Before we continue, I want to remind you to help this channel by clicking the subscribe button and selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. Very little is publicly known about Stephen Tushin's early life. Tushin was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and when he was 11, his father, who at the time aged 43, was not sick nor old, but had lost a desire to go on in life. Tushin describes his father and being in the room when his father died and the powerlessness he felt not being able to do anything. He later went on to live with his grandparents. His grandfather was sick and would eventually pass away in young Tushin's arms. Tushin regards both of these events as life-changing moments. Before getting to Chicago, Tushin left New York City in 1966 with the goal of seeing Marlena Dietrich at Expo in Montreal. He jumped on his bicycle and rode up to Burlington, Vermont, where he found work and stayed for the summer. He spent the next two years traveling New England. Tushin sold his bike, hitchhiked his way across the country, making his way to Chicago. While there, Tushin was staying in a place with 10 young adults his age. He met someone who told him his uncle was looking for a manager for his theater. Tushin said he was interested and was offered the job managing Aardvark Theater in Piper's Alley in Old Town, Chicago. At the time, the theater was showing avant-garde, experimental films made by established underground filmmakers. It wasn't until the theater began showing art films with nudity that the theater began to show a return in numbers. In 1970, the opportunity to show I'm a Curious Yellow presented itself and Tushin took it. The Bijou Theater in Chicago is not the kind of theater you send your kids to for a double matinee on Saturday afternoon. It's a mecca for homosexual sex, both on and off the screen. It's owned by Stephen Tushin. In 1969, Tushin got his first obscenity arrest for showing Jack Smith's film, Flaming Creatures. Tushin couldn't make anything of the arrest since he felt it was an absurd charge. Flaming Creatures is not pornographic, but it did have nudity. Flaming Creatures is now considered an experimental classic. In 1962, however, it was deemed obscene and banned. Tushin made the decision to work in the adult business, not just to be a pornographer or sell porn. He wanted to work in all aspects of sexuality, both straight and gay. For Tushin, sexuality and kink were not just his business, they were his way of life. Tushin and his partners bought a theater in Indianapolis and showed I'm a Curious Yellow again. Upon screening the film, Tushin was arrested for the second time on obscenity laws. He won the case, his license was renewed, and the proceeds from the screenings paid for a down payment and renovation of the theater. 
Afterwards, Tushin and his partners decided that all their theaters would now show hardcore films. Tushin would go on to own straight and gay theaters in Chicago, San Francisco, East Chicago, and Indianapolis. He also owned bookstores, live sex clubs, massage parlors, gay bathhouses, and private BDSM clubs. Tushin began to produce S&M movies in the 1970s on 16mm and would sell them to movie theaters or down-convert them to 8mm for the home market available through mail order or at adult bookstores. Tushin would go on to distribute such films as Everything But the Kitchen Sink, Needles and Pins, Slave and Master, and my personal favorite title, You Said a Mouthful. Under Bijou, Tushin would produce gay and straight porn and BDSM films. He owned a gay video mail order company and distributed and sold poppers. The Bijou video catalog was the bible of gay adult films which gave Bijou the reputation as a place to buy gay films. On November 18, 1987, Tushin watched as men with bulletproof vests, shotguns, and handguns ran through his office. 42 to 45 FBI agents, postal inspectors, Chicago police, and an assistant U.S. attorney swarmed in and around his building. Tushin's business had been surveilled for two weeks by a large mobile home that had been parked down the street. The raid was a part of an investigation that began in 1985 involving postal inspector Perry LaPere of Tennessee. LaPere became aware of Bijou video when a man from Nashville reported receiving unsolicited advertisements from Bijou. LaPere, under a fictitious name, placed an order for a video catalog, which he received by mail. LaPere ordered videos from the catalog, including Erotic Hands, The Final Chapter of Mistress Anne, Please Sir, and You Said a Mouthful. The raid was a part of finding evidence to support the charges of aiding and abetting, conspiracy mailing obscene matter, and interstate transportation of obscene matter. Stephen Tushin was identified as the largest distributor of gay-type pornographic material in the United States. After gathering enough evidence, U.S. Postal Inspector Perry Lapeer and agents from Tennessee sought and received permission to raid Tushin Chicago headquarters. On the date of the search, there were probably 30 or so employees present and working. We found additional files indicating uh, as many as 50 employees. And these employees were engaged in the full production process of, uh, of video distribution, uh, including the actual filming of uh, various videos at their at the uh, office in the Bijou, a- advertising layouts, uh, duping equipment, banks of VCRs, uh, a large shipping room, uh, anything associated with with the distribution. His main catalog had over 1,100 titles in it, making it the largest catalog of its type in the United States. Uh, it contained. Uh, graphic descriptions of pornographic videos available for sale, the majority of which were gay. Evidence seized during the raid was presented to a grand jury seven months later. Tushin and two of his employees were indicted in Utah and Tennessee. The Utah indictment included six counts against his employees, business, and himself, and two counts for sending advertisements to two fictitious names. The charges in Tennessee were similar, except they included a conspiracy charge. People in the adult entertainment industry had been waiting for a moral crusade since the release of the Mies Report and Commission on Pornography. After the report was released, President Reagan made a speech on America's moral values. He introduced new sentencing guidelines which would put convicted offenders in prison for longer periods of time, which Attorney General Mies had made public in 1986. Tushin's business was targeted by the Mies Commission in its first sting and entrapment operation called Project Post Porn. The government made wild claims about who and what were solicited to, with obscene material and advertising to, to which Tushin retorted, the only way someone would be solicited to was if they sent $20 to receive mailings for a three-month period. Tushin went to trial, and what is detailed in the transcripts is nothing short of insane. The case went to trial with particular movies as the target. Lawyers, the defense, the prosecution, the jurors were all made to watch films as a part of the state's evidence. Jurors fainted, one left and never came back. During sentencing, the judge remarked, the only victims in this trial were the 16 jurors and alternate jurors, plus the courtroom staffers who were forced to view these tapes. The judge placed the responsibility on the postal inspectors who selected the films and the prosecutors who insisted they were shown during the trial. Tushin was asked if he had a statement to make, to which he did and defended himself under the First Amendment. 
While the judge never hid his distaste for Tushin, his companies, and his way of life, he did, however, care about the Constitution and personal liberties. Tushin received five years probation that ran concurrently with the time he was currently serving. Tushin was released from prison in April of 1990 after winning an appeal on his tax case. After he was released, Tushin was able to obtain transcripts and court testimonies describing in detail the government's intention to have him murdered. He obtained these files through a criminal attorney in Chicago who also happened to represent Frank Schweiss in his trial. Park Elliott Dietz, an expert witness who testified in the Stephen Tushin case, would also testify in the Jeffrey Dahmer case three years later. Dahmer coincidentally killed one of Tushin's employees, Jeremy Weinberger. Jeremy, who worked at the Bijou, left Chicago early Saturday morning to Milwaukee with a stranger he had met the night before at a local bar called Carol's Speakeasy. After a day of not hearing from Jeremy, who was a committed good worker and friend, the staff at Bijou began to worry. Days turned into weeks. After the grisly news began to pour out of Milwaukee, police came to the Bijou where Jeremy worked and asked to speak to one of Jeremy's co-workers, who had spoken to the police when they filed a missing persons report earlier. Stephen Tushing is a fascinating individual who became the owner and founder of Bijou Video, a huge advocate and believer of civil liberties, and very involved in the SM community. And it's pretty easy to surmise that people today don't really know, many don't care about the history of legal battles fought by nude and fetish magazines, adult bookstores, private clubs, and filmmakers. Tushin's trial would be the first of its kind because it created the first legal debate about the meaning and practice of sadomasochism. And it also scientifically and legally re defined s and as a sexual subculture practiced by consenting adults for mutual pleasure. Jeffrey Begun and Paul Gonski were college friends in the early 1960s and founded the Aardvark Cinematheque, where Stephen Tushin would go on to be theater manager. After graduating from college, Begun and Gonski were inspired by the underground film scene. They rented space from the comedy group Second City and would host screenings of experimental films under the series name Aardvark Cinema. Their success was part due to the success of Andy Warhol's Chelsea Girl. The film broke the underground filmmaking into the mainstream consciousness. Begun and Gonski aligned themselves to the underground and its confrontational attitude and began to create screening series all around Chicago. The Second City Comedy Troupe would move into a bigger space and offered Gonski and Begun to build their own theater and a third ownership. With the move, Aardvark Theater was now a fully functioning theater that could seat 200 people and it was renamed Aardvark Cinematheque. They would go on to be associated with counterculture films as well as the cinematic sexual revolution. The theater repeatedly battled police raids and censorship attempts. Known for being a theater for true film buffs, screening only the weirdest of the weird, the Aardvark could no longer make money. This, plus the cost of film rentals, paying for a union projectionist, staff, and general upkeep, made the operation very expensive. And the union projectionist was an important piece of the puzzle here. If the theaters chose not to hire a union projectionist, they were known to take violent action, and the union was linked to firebombings and at least seven murders and the mafia. The theater then booked a film called Man and Wife, a sexually explicit film that would make more money in one weekend than the theater had in weeks. Slowly, the Aardvark transitioned from art house films to straight porn. With new profits, the Aardvark was allowed to expand, and by the mid-1970s, Gonski and Begun owned and operated over half of all the pornographic houses in Chicago and West Indiana. The two then brought Stephen Tushin in as a partner and formed Festival Theatre Corporation. At its height, Festival Theatre paid over 100 employees and operated 10 theaters, a distribution company specializing in art house and porn, a production company, a pornographic bookstore, a parking lot, a health food store, and a short-lived tourist attraction called Electronic Odyssey in Old Town near the Aardvark. Around noon on a September day in 1976, Paul Gonski was found lying on the ground in a parking lot near the Bijou Theater. One or more of the seven bullets that had smashed into his body shattered his head. 
His murder was never solved, but suspects in the murder included mob enforcer Frank Schweiss, a rival pornographer Patrick Patsy Ricciardi, and even Gonski's partner Stephen Tushin. Gonski had previously taken Tushin to court under suspicion by his partners that he was funneling money into his own pockets. Begun took Gonski's assassination as a message and fled to California. Festival Theater Corporation fell apart, and Stephen Tushin was now the owner of the Bijou. Bijou came about in 1970, basically about a year, year and a half after Stonewall. You couldn't go at that time if you were building a theater like the Bijou, which was a small 77th seat theater. You couldn't go into the building department and say, excuse me, but I want to get a building permit so I can build a porn theater. So basically we went in there on saying we're going to be an art house. It opened with a, with a film called Richard Nixon's Checker Speech. That was a documentary on, on Richard Nixon who said to the world, I am no longer going to be in politics. You cannot going to kick Richard Nixon around anymore. I played for six weeks. Then we turned over to gay porn. Porn did a lot better. That's when the Bijou basically was born. The whole transformation was taking place, and that transformation came to theaters like the Bijou. After the first couple of years of exciting films, the enthusiasm began to die down, and theater owners were going to have to up the ante to get people back in seats. Films like El Paso Wrecking Corps, Drive, L.A. Tool and Die, and The Idol were the kinds of films people wanted to see. The famed Bijou catalog was a concise and informative collection of gay videos from around the world. The catalog described thousands of titles, classic to contemporary, and was illustrated with hundreds of images of men from all walks of life. For the price of $20, you can receive the catalog and order from the comfort of your own home, assuming your state allowed for the shipment of pornographic material. By the late 1970s and early 1980s, the Bijou would become a more sexual experience when the second floor opened its doors as a sex club. Travel magazines would recommend the Bijou as a gay men's fantasy playground with glory holes, dark corners, and a BDSM dungeon with slings, crosses, and many other fetish objects. The Bijou also featured an outdoor playground during the warmer months. By the time AIDS became a prevalent epidemic, the Bijou was able to keep its doors open, but began to dispense safe sex materials and condoms. The Bijou would also be the place to go if you wanted to see top billed porn stars. On a given night, you could see Peter Berlin, Al Parker, Richard Locke, Richard Cassidy, to name a few. Bijou would now become a video distributor to many artists and filmmakers at the time, like Tom DeSimone, Jack DeVoe, Peter DeRome, Brian King, Jay Bryan, and Toby Ross. During the 1990s, the Old Town neighborhood began to change. By the 2000s, the theater had slowed down. Business began to wane further. The parties got quieter, but continued through 2015. 46 years after it opened, the Bijou Theater permanently closed its doors on September 30th, 2015, after losing its lease. About the closing, Stephen Tushing would go on to say, It's not the way I wanted to go out. I wanted to have a bit more time if I was going to close down after all these years. But times change, neighborhoods change, building ownerships change, and leases change. Stephen Tushin and partners opened the Bijou in 1970, and it became one of the longest-running gay adult theaters and sex clubs in the United States. For many people who visited or played at the Bijou, there was nothing like it in the world. It was what sex was like in the 1970s and 1980s. It was never pretty. It was deliciously nasty, frequented by locals, return customers, tourists, gay men, bisexual men, married men, who all came to experience things that they probably wouldn't do at home. Bijou Video still operates and sells DVDs online. Thirty-five miles north of New York City, in the Hudson Valley, Nyack to be more precise, half-naked sexy men stood around on a cold fall day in Roman togas and sandals. They were shooting scenes for a yet-to-be-titled gay porn film set in ancient Rome. All the while, the director, John Christopher, the star, Scorpio, and the film's mysterious producer, George Bosque, were in a heated argument about the ever-changing script of the film. How these three men had the fortune of coinciding at this point in time is incredibly interesting. John Christopher was the director of Centurions of Rome. 
He was born in New Jersey and studied film at Montclair State University. He ventured into making pornographic films when he and Chuck Vincent, a regional theater manager, had the idea of making money, gaining experience, and then moving out to Hollywood to hit it big. While at a gay bar one night, Christopher met a man named George. During their conversation, Christopher mentioned to George that he was a filmmaker who made porn films. This immediately got George's attention, who then asked Christopher if he needed an investor and if he would ever make a gay porn film. Christopher was always concerned people would connect him to his adult films. Also, his family didn't know he was making porn films, but George's offer was too good to pass on. George invited Christopher back to his swanky new apartment and showed him a suitcase filled with cash. George asked him how much he would need to make a classy all-male film. They settled on the price tag of $100,000. The actors and crew were hired and production was set to begin in 1981. Jack DeVoe, the founder of Hand in Hand Films and a pioneer during the golden era of gay porn, recommended a new model to Christopher who he was eager to hire. His name was Scorpio. Scorpio was also a New Jersey native who became a stripper after a string of unfortunate events in modeling left him broke and desperate. He would then be offered magazine shoots and began stripping in more clubs. John Christopher came up with the plot for Centurions of Rome, which centered around two Roman countrymen sold into slavery for not paying taxes during Caligula's reign as emperor. On your feet, you filthy bastards! On your feet, I said! You know why we have come. My uncle lives there. You're lying. Why would he lie? Because he can't pay the taxes. That's why he lies. He speaks the truth. No one is at home. Come back tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. Tomorrow is now. They would then have to earn their freedom by seducing their captors. Scorpio would go on to play the lead, and veteran adult film actor George Payne would play Demetrius. Christopher found a prop house in New York City with items from a recent Broadway production set in ancient Greece and rented them for two weeks. Christopher worked hard to make sure the production would be as smooth as possible, but problems began to arise before shooting began. Some of the models were unhappy with what the script called for them to do. The shoot was troublesome for so many reasons. The script, which everyone had memorized, was inexplicably changed the first day of shooting, leaving actors unprepared. The horses which the centurions were to ride were in the hands of models and actors who had never been on a horse before. The crew would laugh at the talent and all the goof-ups, and then they realized that the shoot was going to take longer than expected and they were going to be paid more, so they milked it. Catering was extravagant and featured food, drinks, and drugs. At the end of the day, everyone would get paid in cash from George's suitcase. Some of the models even got friendly with George, a tall, dark, and handsome man who didn't say no. Additional scenes for the film were shot at Plato's Retreat in New York City, and some shots were stolen, like the ones in front of Federal Hall in New York City. After the shoot wrapped, George threw a party at the underground nightclub in New York City where upon entrance, every guest would receive a welcome package that included a gram of coke and a couple of joints. Post-production was about to begin, and George became harder and harder to contact. Christopher, needing money for post-production, approached Jack DeVoe, who agreed to provide the remaining money for ownership of the finished product. The film now had a name, Centurions of Rome, and yes, it is misspelled, and was misspelled in all the credits and all the publicity. By this point in the project, George Bosque had ghosted everyone. Christopher never heard from or saw George again. The film was done and was eagerly anticipated. It opened at the 55th Street Playhouse and was claimed to have earned $160,000 in the first few weeks. The reviews for Centurions of Rome were mixed to say the least. From all the models with Jersey accents to all the partying on set that was evident in the final product, the Film World Guide would call it an artistic failure and the strangest gay adult film ever made. So who was this George Bosque that funded the most expensive gay porn film made at that time? And where did he go? Well, where do I begin? In a nutshell, George Bosque was born in Miami, Florida in 1955, the son of Cuban immigrants who came to the United States in the early 1950s. He attended Catholic school and then a military academy for Wallah families in South Florida. Described as a precocious young man, he also thought he was smarter than everyone else. He became infatuated with law and order and would go on to apply for the police force in Miami-Dade, but was passed over for service. He attended college at the Citadel Military Academy in Charleston, South Carolina, with the hopes of getting into West Point 
but he did not. George would then move to Washington, D.C., where he was hired as a police dispatcher. There, he would begin to frequent gay bars and met the love of his life, Carl Denton. And although George loved Carl very much, he was very closeted and very fearful of his father finding out he was gay. At this time, he also began to experience epileptic seizures and was worried that this would end his career in law enforcement. George and Carl would move to San Francisco where he would immediately apply for the police force and was rejected. He then went to work for the San Francisco Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, from which he was fired for reasons undisclosed. From there, George got a job as a special police officer, which charged private clients hourly rates for protection services. George was fired from that job as well. But then everything changed when he applied for a job at Brinks. He passed a lie detector test, fingerprint, and background checks. They did not know about his two arrests, his epilepsy, or that one time he pulled a gun on a friend. George's job at Brinks was being a part of an armed five-man team that would move cash from one San Francisco bank to another. It was a great job and he should have been happy. But at home, things weren't so great, and Carl would end up leaving George. On August 15th, 1980, George and a Brinks driver arrived at the San Francisco International Airport in an armored truck to pick up a money shipment from Honolulu, which they were to take to the Federal Reserve Bank downtown. A total of $7 million. After loading the truck, George told the driver the airline official wanted to speak with him. When the driver left, George drove the truck to the nearby Hilton Hotel, where he abandoned it, but not before he took two of the seven sacks of cash with him and stole a car from a hotel employee at gunpoint. George made off with $1.85 million. The victims were Honolulu First Hawaiian and Central Pacific Banks. Though checks covering the losses were sent out by Brinks and covered by insurers Lloyds of London. Holy shit, right? The FBI and local police are following up on all leads. Brinks company executives say the suspect got away with quite a haul. It is United States currency. And we know that it's in excess of one million. By that you mean it was all cash that uh, he took? That's correct. George was eventually caught after he went back to San Francisco with little money, lonely and looking for his ex Carl. A friend had spotted him and wanted the $150,000 reward offered for information on his whereabouts. George would go to trial and the prosecutor was a young, aggressive attorney in his late 30s named Robert Mueller. George was given 15 years at a federal correction institution in Pleasanton, California. As for Centurions of Rome, Lloyds of London filed papers in New York against Hand in Hand Films claiming ownership of the movie. When they went to court, Hand in Hand's defense was an unusual one. Perhaps the film was funded with stolen funds. Who knows? But with Lloyds of London, founded centuries earlier in 1688 to provide insurance to some of the most fabled merchants and ship owners in maritime history really want to own a hardcore gay pornographic film still photographs of the movie were passed around court anal sex galore george Payne fisting caligula a daisy chain of oral sex between gladiators lloyd's eventually stood down as for george bosque he was released on parole in 1986 and would die of a drug overdose on July 1st, 1991. So there you have it. Usually I like to review a film in this section, or at least give you a rundown, but I thought all of this was more exciting to know when you go and watch Centurions of Rome. If you're intrigued by the behind-the-scenes stories of Centurions of Rome, I will absolutely have to refer you to Ashley West's article in The Daily Beast, as well as his podcast, The Rialto Report, who has based an entire episode on the behind-the-scenes of Centurions of Rome and is definitely worth a listen. You've been watching Demons to Find Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Telegram. If you like what you're watching and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn, where you can help this YouTube channel and I can continue making content like this. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande. And if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Cheers. Cheers.